Mosquitoes are an unpleasant fact of summer, but 2012 has been especially bad for running into these irritating insects because some carry West Nile virus, and they're known to have infected some 2,000 people in 48 states this year. At least 87 people have died from the infection, which can cause swelling in the brain. Almost half the cases have been in Texas, and to lower risk of infection, some areas have taken extreme measures, including aerial pesticide spraying. But people can take some simple measures on their own to reduce their risk. In an essay in Annals of Internal Medicine, public health experts make recommendations. First, simply avoid areas likely to have mosquitoes. And if you can't or don't want to stay indoors, wear long clothes that cover your skin and use insect repellent. Eliminating standing water, such as that pooled in puddles or unused containers, can also help reduce mosquito breeding grounds and populations overall. Stopping the mosquito spread helps in the long run, which is what we have to deal with, because scientists say that West Nile virus is, unfortunately, here to stay. What's the first thing you do when you get to a hotel room? Turn on the light, kick off your shoes, and turn on the tube? If so, congratulations! You've likely just made a quick tour of the places in the room that harbor the most bacteria. Sure, there are a lot of bacteria in the bathroom, but that's not the hottest spot for bugs. Some of the highest concentrations of microbes were on the light switch, the carpet, and the television remote. The findings were presented at the American Society for Microbiology's 2012 general meeting. The researchers sampled 18 surfaces from nine hotel rooms in three different states. They found that 81% of those surfaces had at least some fecal bacteria on them. But of course, not all of these bugs are going to make you sick. The study was in part to help inform cleaning protocols. Some hotel chains are already pledging to keep their properties a little more germ-free, so your next stay might be a little cleaner. Just don't investigate CSI style with a black light. You'll never be able to sleep.
I think what, what is the most remarkable about Dexter is his capacity for stress management. Michael C. Hall, in a conversation about his TV character at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City on October 24th, he spoke with psychologist Kevin Dutton, author of The Wisdom of Psychopaths. And, and I think that's, that's because of his ability to, as the heat goes up, his Absolutely. internal temperature goes down. Yeah, he, yeah. He, the, the crazier things get, the cooler he feels. He almost craves chaos. He, he seems to attract it, cultivate it, mm. encourage it, because it's the only thing that somehow soothes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very realistic, actually, because what you find is it, that the more chaotic a situation, the more that psychopaths have to make decisions under pressure. Uh, the better their decision making gets, and we've seen it with Dexter, the more the, the, the pressure builds, the cooler he gets. And that is exactly what you see with psychopaths, it really is. Beneath its adorable exterior, is your cat hiding the heart of a killer? Researchers now estimate that each year, domestic cats kill billions of birds and mammals in the United States alone. The report is in Nature Communications. We already knew that domestic cats can wreak havoc on islands, causing 14% of species extinctions and ranking as one of the world's 100 worst invasive species. But now, scientists have reviewed previous studies to find just how much damage cats do on the mainland. Cats kill some 1.4 to 3.7 billion birds and 6.9 to 20.7 billion small mammals in the U.S. each year. These numbers mean that felines may be the biggest human-related cause of death for American birds and mammals. And cats tend to prey on native species species, which can cause major ecosystem damage. The worst feline killers are those without owners, and reducing feral cat populations is an ongoing problem, but you can still reduce the impact of domestic cats by keeping your pet indoors, thus leaving the neighborhood a little less red in tooth and claw. <laughs>
Last week on the podcast, we talked about space health. Specifically, we told you about a new paper discussing the role that physicians will have to play in determining which citizens are fit enough for commercial jaunts into space. Now let's leap ahead and much farther afield. What kinds of issues might a crew of astronauts face on a longer journey, say, a round trip to Mars? To find out, six volunteers spent a record 520 days confined to a simulated space habitat near Moscow. They emerged in 2011. Now, a report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences shows that the simulated spaceflight did have real effects. Removed from natural light and the rhythms of everyday life, four crew members experienced some type of sleep disturbance, and one exhibited signs of chronic sleep deprivation during regular alertness tests. Overall, the crew also became more sedentary with time. The researchers conclude that a real Mars mission would need to incorporate tactics such as timed light exposure or exercise to keep astronauts' circadian rhythms on beat, because it would be a bad idea to land on Mars sleepy and out of shape. The Curiosity rover has achieved plenty of firsts in its six months on Mars, and the last first is especially noteworthy. On February 9th, NASA announced that Curiosity had made the inaugural run of its drill, boring into a rock to extract a sample from the interior. It thus became the first robot ever to drill on Mars. Curiosity has now gotten some use from most of its science instruments, but not all of them are working. At a conference at UCLA, Deputy Project Scientist Ashwin Vasavada explained that problems are facing the rover's wind and humidity sensors. The humidity sensor is being calibrated. They think it's still going to produce some good data. Uh, it's measuring a good signal. It's just the, the physical units don't quite make sense right now. Worse is the wind sensor, damaged during the rover's landing. The wind sensor is actually six different sensors. We lost two of them during landing, and the other four are proving pretty hard to interpret as well. So we actually have no wind data yet. A few glitches are to be expected. After all, the Curiosity rover, with its unprecedented size and complexity, is a first in and of itself.
Medicinal tablets are nothing new. Doctors have been dispensing pills for thousands of years. And now, archaeologists have turned up some of those ancient medicines, which were preserved in a shipwreck for close to two millennia. The second century Pozzino wreck was discovered in 1974 off the coast of Italy. Its cargo included medical equipment, like a cupping vessel, iron probe, and tin boxes of supplies. And in one of those boxes, researchers recovered five gray tablets. Now, they've analyzed the antique medication. The work is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The pills primarily contain zinc compounds, probably the active medicinal ingredients, but researchers also detected starch, pollen, charcoal, fats, and linen fibers. Those fibers help the tablets hold their round, loaf-like shape, which may be the key to the medication's use. The Greek word meaning small round loaves also inspired the word calerium, or eye wash. The pills were probably either dissolved in liquid or ground into a powder and used to treat eye conditions. Who knows, maybe Hippocrates used them on his pupils. Kids today may be more familiar with the sound of a rushing highway than a rushing river. But imagine that the internal combustion engine could be set aside and we could design the soundscape of our future. What oral environment would you choose for traffic? For the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the answer is that new cars should sound like old cars. Hybrid and electric vehicles can be so quiet that people outside the vehicle can't hear them. So these two quiet cars will be required to sound something like this. The Obama administration wants a million electric vehicles on the road by 2015. Slow sales of cars like the Chevy Volt and Tesla Model S may keep that number from being reached. But there are still hundreds of thousands of EVs and hybrids on the road today. It's hoped that the new rule will help prevent thousands of pedestrian and cyclist deaths. But the rule also hews to a possibly outdated tradition, like people who set their cell phone ringtone to sound like an old rotary phone. And it's wasting a chance to reimagine what our cars, roads, and even cities could sound like.
Being physically active has numerous benefits. Now a study has looked closely at the effects of fitness in the midlife years for preventing debilitating chronic diseases later. The ongoing study gathered fitness stats for more than 18,000 adults and followed their health status into old age. Assessing 40 years of that data, the analysis finds that those who had higher fitness levels in their 30s, 40s, and 50s were substantially less likely to have a chronic condition between the ages of 70 and 85. The findings are in the archives of internal medicine. Physical fitness seemed to stave off heart disease and heart failure, which might not be a big surprise, but it also reduced rates of diabetes, kidney disease, and even Alzheimer's disease. Current recommendations suggest adults make time for at least 20 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day, such as fast walking, jogging, biking, or swimming. Busy middle-aged people might find it especially hard to make time for such exercise, but a small investment looks like it could pay big health dividends for decades to come. Sharing is one of the hallmarks of human behavior. Give me a cookie and I'm more likely to give you one later. But our bonobo cousins have an odd variation on the practice. They share with strangers before friends. The findings in the journal PLOS One. Researchers tested bonobo sharing in experiments involving 14 of the apes. All were born in the wild. In the primary experiment, bonobos were placed in a cage with food, and they could choose to admit either a known member of their group, a stranger, or both. In 51 trials, most bonobos shared the feast, but they let the stranger in first. Why choose an outsider over a friend? In another experiment, the scientists found bonobos only shared when doing so led to a social interaction. Giving up some food to strangers lets these apes expand their social network. This behavior may have evolved to promote social tolerance, in contrast with chimps' sometimes deadly aggression against strangers. Which means that even when food is offered, there's still no such thing as a free lunch.